Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV. My name is Andrew Sumner and today I've got a real treat for you. Uh, we recently ran a bunch of panels for Anaheim's WonderCon convention for our friends at WonderCon. Hello everybody at WonderCon. And uh, the first of these virtual WonderCon at home panels was for Cynthia Von Bueller's Minky Woodcock series. Now Cynthia Von Bueller is an incredibly talented writer and artist who creates wonderful books for our Hard Case Crime comics imprint, which is edited by the marvellously talented, the supremely talented Charles Ardai. So here is our Wonder Comet Home panel, all about Minky Woodcock, the girl who electrified Tesla, which you can order from the links attached to this panel. Enjoy. Welcome to WonderCon 2021. My name is Andrew Sumner. I'm from Titan Comics and I also host the Forbidden Planet TV um, broadcast channel on YouTube. And I am here with my guests, the, the wonderful author Cynthia Von Bueller and the wonderful editor Charles Ardai. Now let me tell you a bit about these people. <clears throat> Excuse me. Cynthia is an award-winning American artist, author and animal activist. And in her career, she's written and illustrated books for children and adults, created, produced and directed multi-year theatrical productions while exhibiting her art in galleries around the world, including street art installations. Um, Cynthia is particularly well known for the wonderful Illuminati Ball, the brilliant Minky Woodcock series that we publish at Titan and for illustrating Evelyn Evelyn, A Terrible Tale in Two Times. Welcome, Cynthia. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thank you. I'm for great. Me on. I'm great. Thanks for being here at WonderCon, and uh, and and I would also like to to uh, introduce the editor, the man, the myth, the legend, the man behind the hard case crime imprint, Mr. Charles Ardai. Now, Charles, in addition to owning and running hard case crime, which is one of the imprints tied in with Titan Books, our colleagues at Titan Books, Charles has been uh, has received a Seamus Award. Uh, for his uh, nomination for his short story, Nobody Wins. And he received the Edgar Award, get that, in 2007 for his short story, The Home Front. And in 2005, he received the Ellery Queen Award for his, heart work, for his brilliant work on the Hard Case Crime imprint. And if you're not a fan of Hard Case Crime, you will be at the end of this panel. And we are here very specifically to talk about Minky Woodcock, the girl who electrified Tesla. But before we start talking about that, Charles, how are you? How are you, Charles? Good, good. Yeah, you, I, you I'm good? doing well. It's it's great to be uh, great to be here on on uh, on the screen with you. We don't do too much in person meeting anymore in this world of ours, but so it's a little bit of human contact. Yeah, no, a glorious human contact, and and also uh, it's great to be here on this virtual stage at WonderCon 2021. So, absolutely, Cynthia and Charles, what can you tell me? about Minky Woodcock and her latest adventure? Well, I think that editors are really the best at summing up books. So I'm gonna let Charles answer that. Sure, sure. Minky Woodcock is a uh, detective, a private eye, who works for her father, uh, even though he is somewhat reluctant to let her get into the family business. She's determined to do it. She's independent, tough, smart, intrepid. And uh, she's had two cases for us. This is the second. The first was in 1927, having to do with the famous uh, escape artist, Harry Houdini, and his mysterious death on Halloween. It's now nearly 20 years later. It's the height of World War II. And the famous investor, inventor, not investor, although he could have used what a little bit more cash in the bank. Uh, <laughs> the famous inventor, Nikola Tesla, who um, is best known today as the namesake of the electric car line, but back in the day was really one of the most... Uh, rebellious and imaginative inventors in the world. He had a long stunning, uh, long running feud with uh, Thomas Edison over how electric current ought to be uh, run. And uh, toward the end of his life, he claimed to be working on a death ray. Uh, and this death ray comes to the attention of various people in our government, enemy governments, other folks, and they all want a piece of it. And Minky gets hired by several of them to look into this mysterious new invention and many, many uh, menacing and interesting things happen. Wonderful, wonderful. That is that is a fantastic and very gripping synopsis. Um, I guess my question is, having having heard it, is 
would you need to have read uh, the first edition out as a graphic out as a graphic novel from Titan Comics, The Girl Who Handcuffed Houdini, to understand and yeah. enjoy this adventure? No, I actually, I wrote this as a completely separate story, but it would help if you read it, that's great. You, it would, you, we, we talk a little bit about it. There's little, it comes back in little pieces, but for the most part, it's a completely separate story. Yeah, I, th I think I think that's so read a, it. Read the first one, but you don't have to. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great way of answering it. No, you don't need to have. But why wouldn't you read the first one? Because the first <laughs> one's fantastic. So read it, and and, and you know they'll both be available. Um, how would you both would you both describe the arc as a traditional detective story, or do you think it has aspects of noir, hard boiled crime? What kind of bracket would you place it in, if indeed that bracket exists? I would say that it's it's a little different because I'm laying out all the facts and I'm not, it's not the kind of traditional crime story where there's going to be in the end, there's like a definite answer. It's more of a story about that's, that's based on, on true historical facts that uh, will reveal all this information. Um, some people think that maybe uh, Tesla was murdered. I'm, I don't want to, you know, say he was. There, I'm just giving you all the facts and, you know, put that out there. Um, and so I'd say it's a little bit. It's sort of along the same lines, but but not quite. But Charles, what do you think? One of the amazing things Cynthia does is unearth real information about historical figures that you couldn't possibly imagine is true, and it is. Uh, so some of the things that Tesla was fascinated with, his fascination with numerology, for instance. Uh, and some of the peculiar things that he uh, investigated, some of the strange things about the, uh, the animal companions he had in his life, including a pigeon that he described uh, his relationship with as being akin to the relationship of a man to a woman. Now, that's very interesting. How many people would say that? Uh, all of these things are true. And that's the wonderful thing. When you read one of Cynthia's detective investigations, it's kind of an interrogation of the whole world in which the story takes place and you come away with a real distinct appreciation for what a peculiar place we live in. Uh, one day, perhaps Minky at a grandmother's age could uh, tackle a case uh, closer in time to our own, our own world. But there's something wonderful about the era of the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And uh, Andrew, your question, you know, noir and hard boiled, and, and this is not an Agatha Christie type whodunit where you've got uh, fair play clues. And as you say, at the end, the, the uh, uh, police come in and arrest the criminal. I think it has a lot to do with the world of noir. Uh, and the fact that it's a graphic novel and not a prose novel is part of the reason for that. You have uh, mysterious uh, settings, you have wonderful uh, lighting and angles, and it feels a little bit like watching a great classic uh, 1940s movie. Yeah, I, I, I also found having been privileged enough to see a lot of the pages, I, I think uh, it, it taps into Eisner's handling of noir to me when I look at it. If you're familiar with Will Eisner's work at all, who's the great, um, you know, who's the great comic book uh, expert in in you know delivering movie style noir pacing on the page and atmosphere. And I think I think what you produced is just suffused with this glorious atmosphere that you really take away as a reader. I, I am trying to look back at some of the old comics, the pulp comics, and try to have that same sort of energy. Yeah, no, I, I think you've been very successful. You uh, it, it's, you really come away with that, I think. Now, speaking of, of coming away with that, what is it that what is it you both would like readers to take away from this story? I'd say that this story is really about, there's it's a few different things, but weapons of mass destruction and how, and how evil they are and how if maybe if women were in charge, they wouldn't be out there. <laughs> But, uh, but I think that it's kind of about, it's, it's about weapons of mass destruction and how, how the government is always looking for something like that. It's also about profit over, um, over everything else. And uh, I feel that if Tesla had funding, we would maybe we would even have free power now, um, free, free energy. He was, he was looking into that. The only reason he decided to do a, a, a weapon of mass destruction, the death ray, which he called the peace ray, was because he wanted to get funding to build his tower, so he could come get free power. Free power. I mean, we could use that in Texas right now, where there's there, 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 where all the power is out. I mean, free power would be great. So if someone had given him money and uh, you know supported him, instead he he died penniless. Yeah, yeah, no, no so so true. 
Um, to focus in on your protagonist, what is it you think makes Minky a great detective or a great lead figure? What do you think, Charles? Well, I, I will say she looks good in a trench coat, but that's a terrible answer. It is useful, <laughs> though, for a, for, for a graphic novel. Uh, okay. You know, Minky, Minky is uh, determined to carve out her place in the world against all odds and against any adversity. Uh, her brother is given pride of place in the detective agency, even though he doesn't want it. He wants to be a Broadway hoofer. Uh, and she goes to her dad and she says, I want this, I want this role. And we don't really understand when we read the first book uh, what all the family history is behind his reluctance to, to let her do that. Is it just run of the mill sexism or is there more to it than that? Uh, and in this new volume, we learn a great deal more and we get closure on some of these issues of her family history that remain mysteries even at the end of the Houdini volume. And I think readers are going to really enjoy that. She's, a, she's very curious too. I think that uh, one of the things that makes a, a great private detective is curiosity. So I think that she's, she's, she's not just interested in getting her paycheck. She wants to like really find out and she digs really deep and she often digs so deep into these crimes that she gets herself tied up in them. So, so um, Lauren Noding, who is our PR manager at uh, Titan Comics, both of whom you will know because she set up this panel for us. Um, she's, a, she's, a big fan of, she's a big fan of Minky and she had specific questions about Minky's father and to what degree he might be supportive of her endeavors in this in this second adventure well he 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 isn't really very supportive of her <laughs> being a, a private investigator he's it, he seems it, it appears that he's real sexist but yeah. in in this episode we find out a little bit more behind that behind why he doesn't want her to be a private detective so he he is sexist but there's more to it it's there's a little bit something a little deeper than that now, now I'm going to introduce just a little droplet of spoiler here, not for this, not for for this adventure, but for the first comic where Arthur Arthur Conan Doyle pops up and mentions that his character Sherlock Holmes was based on Minky's father. So, Lauren's next question, which she asked me, was, "Do we have any more appearances from other famous authors to look forward to in this arc?" We don't have any famous authors, but we do have some famous people. We have uh, Josephine Baker oh, makes amazing. an appearance. Yeah. She's actually partners with Minky in this episode. Uh, most, many people don't realize that Josephine Baker herself was, she was, uh, during World War II, she was a spy. So I, I'm pulling information from that. So this, you know, she's, she was dealing with Nazis and going and, and drinking with them and, and getting information from them and passing it on to the French government. So I have, we have Josephine Baker and surprisingly enough, we have, we have uh, Donald Trump's uncle Whoa. was involved in Tesla's case, which is another really bizarre fact, but it's true that Donald Trump's uncle was a scientist, believe it or not, and he was, uh, he was uh, asked to look into whether or not the death ray was real, whether it was, uh, you know, uh, something that could actually be made. So he's in it. And then we have, of course, we have JP Morgan, who was an investor in Tesla, but then was just kind of trying to control him. Um, and and so, you, you have the best model in the world for JP Morgan. Yes, you. <laughs> Charles, of course. I was, I was the model for JP Morgan. I'm very, very proud of it. <laughs> you were really good. I, I actually oh, was going to just. I, I got to hold a cigar, and uh... he didn't know how to hold a cigar. He was holding it like a cigar. Right, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, Charles, to, to the uninitiated, is famous for straddling the worlds of editorial creativity and high finance, right? You know, which makes you relatively, relatively unusual. It might make you unique because I'm trying to think of anybody else I know <laughs> who I've met in 35 years of, of, of writing and editing that's got your background. And I don't think I ever have. Right. It's, it's a little bit odd. I, I, I do remember back in the day when uh, when Amazon was getting started and uh, everyone thought that it was a wild, uh, a wild lark on the part of Jeff Bezos, who worked at the same company I did. And uh, I thought of him as a book lover first and a business person second when he started Amazon. And I remember having conversations with him when I, where I would say, this is a great thing for, from the point of view of loving books, but selling books on the internet is not likely to be a, a big business, Jeff. 
Uh, so don't ever, ever, ever take investment advice from me. <laughs> now, mo moving into into an alternate dimension of questions, um, would you would you say, Cynthia? I, I'd be very interested in knowing who your inspirations were for Minky, whether that be fictional characters, real life detectives, or famous women of history. Who who inspired you to create this character? Uh, I'd say, I mean, I'm really interested in that time period, you know, the, the, the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And I've actually been doing a little bit of investigation myself. I've done, I, I investigated the death of my grandfather. And uh, he was a bootlegger during Prohibition here in New York City. And he was murdered and I investigated that. So I sort of became a, an investigator. And then, um, you know, there's some interesting people. There's um, Frances Glesner Lee, who is uh, this little old woman who made forensic dollhouse models. And I find her really fascinating, like this woman who back then was, 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 was recreating crime scenes, like bloody crime scenes with dolls. I don't know if you've heard of her, but, um, but of course, Miss Marple, you know, like, and then there's a, uh, there's a woman named uh, Maud West who was a private detective in the 20s. And, and uh, so, you know, there's, there were female private detectives out there. I was also looking at a lot of the old pulp crime, you know, these, these the women, like they're sexy, but they're strong and they're powerful. And so I was kind of looking to that, looking at that for, for inspiration. Yeah, okay, that, that really does make a lot of sense. And what difference do you think it makes uh, having a female protagonist in what was very much traditionally a male role throughout the 20th century? What do you think Minky's femininity brings to the story and to the case? Well, I mean, I think she uses her femininity. Like she will, she's not afraid to use her sexuality um, uh, for power, but I think that it's a little, it, people wouldn't expect a woman back then to have been a detective. And I think that her, she's coming at this and, uh, and they might not expect her. They just like kind of write her off, but she's actually, you know, so I think that having a female detective is just a little bit more interesting. And I think having it come from a, a female mind, you're getting a different perspective because a lot of times the crime, you know, these, these crime stories are written by men. So you're getting this different perspective from a female per, uh, point of view. Yeah. Okay. Well said. How, how about yourself, Charles? What do you think about that question? Well, people underestimate Minky at their own peril, but they do it. Um, also, the detective in a detective story is typically an outsider, even when it's a male detective. Someone like Philip Marlowe or Sam Spade goes uh, around high society uh, clubs and, and settings and doesn't fit in. You know, he's the working class lout uh, who is forcing himself on, the, uh, the, on his betters in some sense and from a social equality point of view. And how much more so is that uh, gulf between the detective and the uh, people he or she is questioning uh, emphasized when it's a woman instead of a man, and especially so when it's a period story set back in the 30s, 40s, 50s. Uh, and, and so you have this interesting, um, this interesting tension uh, between the person who is, from a social and economic point of view, relatively powerless, but who is holding to account people who are supposed to be able in society to act with impunity. Um, so uh, she outwits the cops, she outwits the FBI, uh, she makes demands of uh, JP Morgan, one of the richest and most powerful men in the world. And uh, she is able to do this because of her tenacity and because of her intelligence and because she finds the answers that no one else can find. Yeah, well said. I think that's very interesting. Um, and uh, actually, just to ask you another question, Charles, how did you end up working with Cynthia on Min Minky Woodcock? How did you end up editing this project and, and you know, bringing it to publication with Cynthia? What was the oh gosh, the I, Cynthia and I, have, have we've known each other for many years uh, and, and in many contexts. And I remember there was a lunch that we had years ago before we'd ever done any work together, uh, just for fun. And we talked about the idea of doing a comic book. I think at the time, Cynthia, uh, you hadn't done a comic before. You'd done illustrated volumes, but not specifically a comic. Uh, and I remember uh, warning you the, that the amount of work was enormous because you have to think this is, uh, you know, this is 88 pages of strip and each page has perhaps an average of five panels on it. So you're talking about 400 or 500 separate pieces of art and uh, even a prolific illustrator, it, that's a huge amount of work. I mean, you're, you're, your hands get numb and, and you're working to deadlines. And I remember saying you should only do this if it would be something you really love. 
uh, something that you'd have a lot of fun doing. And and uh, uh, and then Cynthia, you came up with uh, with Minky, and I fell in love with it too. You know, I've been a Houdini fan all my life. You know, it, it, for a for a Jewish kid uh, growing up in New York City and uh, being fascinated with magic, the idea that there was this great you know Jewish immigrant kid fascinated with magic who became the most uh, one of the most famous people in the world uh, by his own wits. Houdini has always been a fascinating character to me, and so when. Uh, when Cynthia said, we're going to investigate Houdini's death, I was sold. I, I didn't need any persuading. I think you liked the title, too. <laughs> yes, yes. The girl you know, who had the Houdini. I, had, I think I had the title at the time, and, I, and you were like, well, that's a great title, the girl <laughs> who had the Houdini. It's, it's true. And then Tesla, you know, Tesla came about in, in a kind of different way. Uh, and again, what really hooked me in the end when, when uh, Cynthia had the title, it was just a perfect title, The Girl Who Electrified Tesla. And you know, how do you follow Houdini? That's a very hard act to follow. Literally back in the day, he's, he was the headliner. Nobody followed Houdini, you know? Everyone preceded Houdini and then he was the big closing act. And how do, how do you top that? And you can't top Houdini, but Tesla in his own way is, uh, is just as intriguing and just as out there and, and fascinating. Uh, by the way, Cynthia, I've got a question for you. Do you happen to know whether the correct pronunciation is Tesla, like an S, or Tesla, like a Z? I think it's with an S. Okay, I, you know, I, I just I'm don't know. Positive. That's actually a really good question. Actually, everybody pronounces his first name incorrectly, but- uh, and What's the right way? Yeah, what? Nicola. What's the right way to say it? Nicola. Nicola. Oh, so okay. it's not pronounced Nikolai? No, it's not Nikolai or Nic Nicola or- really? <laughs> I, I, I never Nicola. knew that. I, 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 I always I, say it to, to rhyme with the, the, the cough drop, you know, Ricola. The, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think, well, I, I don't know, I mean, we, we should probably ask somebody who is, you know, from his same country, how to, you know, what the real pronunciation is. I, I don't yeah. know. I think it's Tesla. I don't think it's, you know, with a Z. I think it's with an S. But we should look into that. That would be, yes, yes. <laughs> you should be pronouncing it correctly. Maybe there's a sequel here, which is the girl who uncovered the pronunciation of Tesla's <laughs> name. <laughs> there you go. It might be a more limited audience, but I'll read yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You know, that there are, there, are, there are English and grammar fiends everywhere in the world, you know, so absolutely. never underestimate the audience, right? Um, now, what is, sp speaking of, uh, speaking of uh, Tesla himself, um, Charles, were you excited to hear that um, Cynthia had plans for a second Minky arc and had plans to take Minky in the direction that she has? Oh, very, very much so. You know, one of the things that I find most interesting about it is the gap in time between the first volume and the second. Typically, in a series, very little time passes between one book and the next. Spider-Man doesn't get any older. In fact, he never gets any older. He's still yeah. a teenager after uh, 60 years. Uh, but in this case, you see, get to peek in at Minky at two very different stages of her life. You know, she was basically a teenager, I think maybe literally a teenager or almost yeah. just out of her teens uh, in the first volume. And she was experiencing her very first case. She was a rookie detective. And now here we are 17 years later, and she's uh, more of a seasoned veteran. And that's, that's two different stages in a person's life. I, I'm different than I was 17 years ago. Uh, 17 years ago, I was just starting Hard Case Crime. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's a particularly nice... Uh, opportunity to give readers a different taste of the same character. Yeah, That's well true, said. right. It's, 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 you know, we, it's sort of a big jump between it's sort of the beginning and the end because there's a whole backstory about her parents. And in this, in this episode, you actually find out what, what that is, right? So the, the backstory gets kind of answered in this one. Oh, lovely. Yeah, I've, I've got a question for, for both of you, which is for each of you, do you have a favorite aspect of Minky's world, of Minky's universe that you like working on that you appreciate? Hmm. I know well, it I must like be it. difficult for you, <laughs> Cynthia, because you know when you're the creator, the, uh, <laughs> it to be you created it all, right? So you know, there's a lot. I mean, I really love. I, I really, really, I'm very curious, and I really love looking, finding these bizarre details that you you read it and you think that can't be true. And then you go and find out that it's actually true. You'll Google it. And I think that's really interesting. I love it when I'm reading a book and I read something and I think, is that really true? And then you go and Google it and you find out more about it. And then you go down all of these rabbit holes. And I, that's one thing I like about, there's a lot of rabbit holes in, in these books. I also really love animals and I love bringing animals into it. So I know that I'm always bringing in this time I've got the pigeons and I actually raise pigeons. So it's like, it's, it's really interesting to be bringing in the pigeons and I've got the rabbit. And so I really love bringing animals into my stories. I also illustrate children's, I write and illustrate children's books. So well, I like to put a little bit of that in there. 
Can I, can I ask a question though? Because I'm glad you brought up the pigeon raising. Because uh, so just to just to uh, digress for a second. So I'm from the north of England, right? I'm from uh, Liverpool, city in the north of England, famous city in the, in the north. Oh of England. wow! And uh, and uh, just a bit further north is a county where a lot of my family live. It's called Lancashire. Mm -hmm. That is a very famous part of the world for pigeon rearing, and um, they they call them pigeon fanciers, people yes. who raise, breed, and raise pigeons. Right now. It's as an early, it's, it's an almost completely all male pursuit. Yeah. <laughs> Generally for like working class blue collar guys over the age of 65, <laughs> yeah. who have such thick and, and, uh, uh, you know, robust Northern accents that I think you would both find them very, very difficult to understand. <laughs> and there's a particular uniform they have was essentially they're dressed in these kind of, 1930s s working men's clothes and they all wear flat caps right yeah now it seems to me that you are based upon my experience a somewhat atypical pigeon <laughs> fancy because you don't look like anybody i've ever met or related to who has that as an interest i'd yeah. love to know where that came from okay well it's a little complicated but but my family actually were, were similar to that. And in the Bronx, where my family is from, they used to have pigeons on their roof. And on they, the roofs of the, the apartment class, buildings. Right? Yeah. They, on the roofs, they'd have the pigeons. They'd wear the same outfit with the hat and yeah. the, the <laughs> that they would do, you know. Yeah. And so my family did that. And so, you know, I have that in the history and I did research my grandfather. So, and, the, and it was a story about the Bronx. So, and I made a play about it for, and I ran for years and years in New York City. So I, I had the pigeons in the show um, for that because of, the, because of my grandfather's story and the, I incorporated the pigeons into that story. But also I, you know, I, I, I re rehabilitate animals and somebody brought me a pigeon. Actually, I started with doves. I've been, I was raising doves, I don't know, 30 years ago. And then somebody brought me a pigeon and, uh, and then I got it a friend and then they had babies and now I have 75 pigeons. <laughs> so, but um, I don't race them, I, I rehabilitate them. So I have partners in New York City, when, when they find an injured pigeon, they'll rehabilitate it and then they'll bring it to me and it can live with my pigeons who fly free during the day, but come back at night. Yeah. So I am a little bit unusual, but um, I really love pigeons. They're really, I can see, I can understand why t Tesla was in love with a pigeon. I have a pigeon I really like too, very close with. And, <laughs> but when, uh, when I started looking into this story, that was one thing that I really caught my eye was the fact that he loved pigeons and I love pigeons. And there's some connections to, uh, that I have to this story. Um, you know, another connection I have to the story is the fact that my, grand, my, my father worked at General Electric making, designing, uh, guidance systems for nuclear weapons. So like I grew up in a town where, where um, everybody was making nuclear weapons. So like I have this whole, you know, and every day at, at noon an alarm would go off and you'd say, what's that alarm? And then they would, they'd say, oh, if it goes off at any other time, we're being bombed. So <laughs> yeah, well, like, I have like, so I have this idea about nuclear weapons that, you know, that I'm, that's coming out in this story. Also yeah. GE is part of this story. Many people don't under, don't know this, but Thomas Edison, his company was was General Electric. It started as uh, as uh, Edison's company, but then it became General Electric. So in tr that's such an interesting set of answers, I think. Um, <laughs> I know thanks. it went off on a tangent, but yeah, that, that, that's <laughs> but what I love back. though. Exploring the tangent is always the always truly interesting thing to do, and you looped it back brilliantly to your story <laughs> as well. Which that there's a real there's a real art in that. I think <laughs> that that your childhood experience of growing up in the uh, the nuclear development town that's rather harrowing actually, because I imagine you grow up in a state of constant all-consuming concern because every time you hear a klaxon <laughs> go off, it's like, oh, we're we getting bombed. You know, it must be. I actually Such didn't really, I really know it growing up. I mean, you couldn't even go to General Electric. They wouldn't let you in. It was yeah. sort of a secret thing. And you, and you, you, we would get calls. Like I remember someone rang the doorbell and they said, they started asking me questions and they said, have you seen any, any, anybody around where, you know, with, with big cars and like, they were looking to see if there were any spies in our, like <laughs> living in our neighborhood. Like, and I was a little girl and someone's like some guy in a, who looks like a character in my book is ringing the doorbell and asking a little girl, have you seen anybody in, in limousines on your street? I'm like, no, but it was a very weird place to grow up, definitely. 
Wow. Uh, and th th this dovetails nicely into my next question and may or may not figure into the answer. Who knows? Uh, so uh, one of the things that, that you have, Cynthia, is a very unique art style. And it seemed to me that uh, it's dark in places and it's very colorful, colorful in others, much like you work on the Illuminati ball. And it has this, this very kind of vivid, sensual energy to it as well. So, so what artistic style or what experiences would you say influences your art the most? If, if anything influences it the most, or where does it come from inside your head? Well, I, I actually have worked in many different styles. And, um, you know, my painting style is very Renaissance looking and I use three dimensional objects in it. I've, I've worked with dollhouses. I've worked, you know, I work in many different styles but I guess that the, the number one thing about that's cohesive about my style is that I look to past periods and I recreate them and add a modern, modern touch to them. So, so that's what I'm doing with this. I'm, I'm looking to the old comic books. I wanted it to look like the paper of an old comic book and the women, the way they're, you know, like you, you always see them and they're crying and they're like, oh, you know, very exaggerated. Yes. I, yeah. I kind of, I love that look. So I'm, I'm just sort of looking at a style and then bringing myself to it. So I will modernize it. I'll take the style and I will recreate it, but then modernize it. And this one has grown a little, like there's like, I really have this, this I've been working on this sense of lighting coming in. And um, I think that that works really well, the lighting uh, in this book, because it's about electricity. So, yeah. um, so, so it's sort of been growing as I, as I go, but, but, uh, but I've looked to vintage, you know, other different errors and then, and modernize them. That's, that's very interesting. And just to explore that a little bit more, um, how would you say that it strikes me that, um, something you do is you use, you know, art and color to, uh, create emotional intensity and to vary the tone within your work. Can you, can you talk about that process a bit, please? The, the emotional intensity of yeah the, how that relates to your use of color and your use of you know your use of illustrative technique oh an interesting question <laughs> um well i really love jewel tones i love these deep colors i i actually don't like comics that have that really bright flat color i like like colors with depth and in all of my art. And I think that that does kind of make it a little bit more, more visceral for it to be more moody and more, more um, mysterious. So I, I think the colors are more mysterious and that gives it an intensity that, that I like. Did I yeah. answer your question? You did. <laughs> and if, if it took you back somewhat, that is a classic comic book nerd question that I just asked you. <laughs> you know, so, and because- I like, Whoa, that came out of because because you, your style is is really quite uh different from your from your classic four color comic book it, it's i think one of the things that really makes the the art work and pop right so yeah that's what but you answer you you absolutely did answer the question i was asking and uh and, and it, it it's i think it's one of the most successful elements of your work personally you know as, as a reader thank you and when you're actually when you're actually going through your creative process would you say that you enjoyed the writing or or the illustration? Do you enjoy one more than the other? Do you enjoy them both in different ways? What's your experience with that? Um, I do enjoy both. And I think the writing is a little bit more of a challenge for me. I've been, I've been an artist for really like since I was a baby. I mean, I've been had a pencil in my hand. So the art comes very easily to me. And it's the, the, the writing is something that I really love and I love the challenge of it and I love improving and, and um, I couldn't see myself writing a, a, a traditional novel. I am definitely the type of person who writes books with pictures. And I'm working, you know, I'm working right now on a middle grade novel and, you know, and it's with pictures. So I really love graphic novels. When I discovered graphic novels, I thought, this is it. Like it's, it's picture books for adults. It could be for adults. So I don't have, I can have nudity in it. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I was, uh, I, I really loved picture books, children's books, because it was books with pictures, but now there's books for pictures for adults, which is what a comic book is, right? Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, did I answer your question? <laughs> you absolutely did, yeah, no, it, it, it was great. Now, Charles, as an editor, what kind of themes are you, are you looking, are you looking for in a story like Minky? What are the things that speak to you? What, what are the, what are the, what are the things you might look and go, okay, I would re really like this to be dialed up when we're working on this book uh, together. Yeah. Well, can you talk about that a bit? 
Uh, sure, sure. You know, when you have a living writer, and many hard case crime authors are, are long gone, we reprint work from uh, people like Earl Stanley Gardner and James yeah. M. Cain. So you, you can't really give them editorial input. But when you're dealing with a with a living writer, there's the opportunity to shape the story or to help them shape the story. Uh, in the end, the artist's work is is their own, and this is Cynthia's baby, and the themes are her themes. On the other hand, part of what makes it fit so well into hard case crime is this element of uh, cynicism, of darkness, the idea that there are sinister forces at play that maybe the good characters in the story don't entirely know about and are imperiled by. And uh, as the script is taking shape, there's the opportunity to nudge it this way or that a little bit and say, wouldn't it be interesting if? Uh, and one of the great things about Cynthia is uh, she is she's one of the most uh, responsive and collaborative writers I've ever worked with, either in prose novels or graphic novels. So there, there are many times when I'll have a conversation and I'll, I'll tiptoe up to a topic and I'll say, Cynthia, you can ignore this. Here's a, here's a thought I had. Don't feel you have to do it. And without fail, Cynthia will always say, uh, oh, that, that's not necessarily that the idea is great because some of my ideas are terrible, but that, that she's always happy to hear about an idea and consider it, think about it. And a good number of them make their way into the final, uh, into the final book, which is just, just wonderful. You know, if, if you had the opportunity to see how the book has changed from the first draft to the final draft, uh, very often writers are reluctant to change. You know, once you put something on paper, it's there for all time. It's carved in stone like the Ten Commandments. And that's not the case with Cynthia. Cynthia is uh, is innovative and fresh and is always taking a second look at the things she's doing. In fact, I, I think long after I thought the script was done, I kept getting fresh drafts from Cynthia saying, oh, wait, I changed one more thing. Uh, and but it's always for the better. You know, they, it's 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 really fun to fun to do that. And I'll say that you you asked uh, which part is the most fun for, for her. And I'll tell you, for, for me, the thing that's the most satisfying is uh, watching how the script turns into art. You know, you, you read words on a page and it says, uh, Minky takes Tesla's hand and pulls the switch. That could be drawn a million different ways. Yeah. And then along comes Cynthia and she draws it and, and I see the drawn version and I say, I never, never would have thought of that. And that's great. You know, so I wouldn't have thought of that angle. I wouldn't have thought of them, you know, looking at them from underneath. And it's just perfect. It's just so satisfying. It, it's a little bit, like if somebody described the world's best uh, painting to you and said, you know, there, there's this person and the person's got hands on both sides of their cheek and they're on a bridge and you try to imagine what the screen looked like. And then you saw it and you said, oh, okay, now that's the work of an artist because I could never have come up with that. That's so interesting. I, you know, I feel like the same way about the writing. Like you'll come, you'll say, well, that's interesting, but how about do it like this? <laughs> it's like the same thing about the writing. So I love working with Charles because he's a great oh. editor. And, and, you know, but I think sometimes when I'm writing, I have this image in my head. Like I immediately, I'm definitely a, an artist before I am a, a writer. And I have this, I, I have it in my head. So when I'm writing it, I don't even maybe don't describe everything because it's, it's in my head already. I don't need to do that. And you'll say, well, what is this? how is this going to work? I'm like, trust me, it's going to work if I have it in my head. But you do the same thing with writing. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's good to it's good to have collaborators that you really respect and trust because then you can have a lot of fun and end up you know the product's going to be good, you know. And I have absolutely no doubt. Even even if you know you start on day one not understanding how you get from page one to the end, I know it's going to be good. And so you don't have any fear. You can be fearless, and that gives you the chance to do something really good. Uh, it's also fun to to see the covers come together. That's that's fun for me because that's the chance to have uh, you know other artists take a yeah. turn you know, working in this world uh, or see Cynthia, your own work in this world. Yeah, um, I love seeing other artists interpret the, the, my work. And that's something as, as, as an illustrator to, to be on the other end of that. I really love it. It's really, and it, it's, that's one thing I love about graphic novels and comics is that there's so many covers, these variant covers. It's yeah, so fun. It's, it's, just, it's also really good for promotion because it's, oh, it's, great, it's great. It's great. It's great for promotion. Can I just say, guys, it's absolutely heartwarming to see the relationship, the collaborative relationship you guys have as creator and editor. And as Charles knows, I'm an editor myself. In fact, we have some writers who we had in common. And uh, and as Charles also knows, it is not always the case that <laughs> the editor and writer get all, get along so collaboratively. In fact, the the, art, the authors we have in common, we do get on very well with. But to see your relationship, I think it is fantastic. And it is not always this way. And I think yeah. that the proof is in the final product. Absolutely, you can see the collaboration and see the, the joy that you both take in, in working on this universe together in bringing your creation to fruition, Cynthia. I think, it's, uh, I think it speaks for itself and it's wonderful watching you guys talk about it. <laughs> Thank you.
You know, it's, it's always heartbreaking to me when you, you know about a duo that you love and you discover that they hated each other. Like Abbott and Costello <laughs> were at each other's throats. And yes. Hope and yeah. Crosby and, and yeah. uh, you know, Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin or Gilbert and yeah. Sullivan. And at yeah. some point they hated each other. Well, it yeah. hasn't happened to us. <laughs> yes. That is very, very good. You're right. There's nothing more disillusioning. Uh, and But there's nothing more wonderful. Like uh, a good example would be Starsky and Hutch, you know, David Soul and Paul Michael Glazer. When you realise that, you know, in the si late 60s, they're still best friends. That's kind of very heartwarming. So so yeah. I think going for the, um, going for the, uh, you know, going for the lifelong friendship approach to creativity is undoubtedly the way forward. Now we're, we're roaring to the end of this panel, uh, but I've got, I've got two uh, close out questions for our audience. Uh, and one is for both of you, is there any hidden nuggets, any Easter eggs that readers should be looking out for in this arc, in this tale? That's interesting. But they're not, uh, they're not hidden eggs. in the sense. <laughs> I, well, I are, they Cynthia... are there any blatant Easter eggs? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Charles. Well, well you Cynthia, you, you found the actual hotel room that, oh. uh, that, that Tesla lived in and died in. Wow. And you you rented it and you brought all your models to the actual <laughs> scene. I didn't know that room still existed, but it apparently, and I missed that day, so I didn't get to see it in person, but apparently it's still there. And you yeah. went and you took a whole, I don't know, a thousand photographs there can, to make it you realistic. Can, uh, you can rent his the room he lived in, where he lived and he died at the New Yorker Hotel. And even during the pandemic, we decided, okay, we're gonna all wear masks and we're social distance. But we rented the room and we, I slept in the room. It was really interesting. And uh, we, I actually bought this thing. It's, it's, a, it's an electrical thing that you touch and there's sparks. And we, I brought that with me. And some of my models, we all were playing with it, you know, to get her hair to go up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we were trying to bring him alive. It's almost like yeah. a seance in the room to bring him alive with electricity. How, I, how I, I think that the book has a lot of Easter eggs and, and that, that just little weird. There's, I, I love Easter eggs and I think I'm just constantly putting them into the art. So you just have to look for them. That's, that's really wonderful. Um, I kind of fancy checking that room that you knew at the New York out myself, I have to say. But what a great thing to have done. Um, now, last but not least, um, and bearing in mind some of our conversation already, I think I might be know where the answer is going to come from. I might know where the answer is going to come from here. Um, what inspired Minky's love of rabbits? Well, I love animals, so it's just, I love rabbits, I love cats, I love, I have pigs, I have pet pigs. Um, and uh, I just wanted her to have an, a, a sort of a sidekick. And I just felt like a rabbit was good for her. And I have a rabbit named Agatha because we actually did a play called The, the Girl Who Handcuffed Houdini and I, the rabbit was in the play. So I was thinking of bringing the rabbit out. She's in the, she, she lives in my art studio. And sometimes I let her out, but I just thought she's, something's going to get knocked over. I, I've got a cat right here, see? Yeah, <laughs> there we go. L awesome little cat. do you know, the, the rabbit actually draws the art. <laughs> now that makes complete sense. Now, now, of rabbit course. Rabbit poops on the art. <laughs> <laughs> now what I'm, expe I'm, I'm expecting a kind of Lewis Carroll Vista inside your art studio. You know, where, 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 I was thinking where, where of doing this in my art studio. It's yeah. my art studio was weird. <laughs> yeah. I, I love that idea. A Andrew, what you're what you're suggesting, I'd love to see a panel once with the pig, the pigeon, the rabbit, all the animals at drawing boards working hard and Cynthia standing over them saying, deadline, deadline boy. <laughs> yes, uh, absolutely. I absolutely. wish those pigs would draw. That would give them something. They don't really do anything. They they eat and they they, they sleep. <laughs> they warm your heart. Yeah, that surely that's, that's that's the name of a memoir memoir right there. If pigs could draw. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, thank you so much for joining us at WonderCon 2021. I have been in conversation with the marvelous editor Charles Ardai and the super talented creator Cynthia Von Bueller about Minky Woodcock, the girl who electrified Tesla, which is publishing on April 14th, 2021. It is the second arc in the adventures of, Mi of Minky Woodcock out from Hardcase Crime Comics. And you will you'll love it. You will really enjoy it. Thanks so much for joining me today, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Wonderful to see you both. Take care. Bye, okay. everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
So that was the amazingly gifted Cynthia Von Bueller talking about her graphic novel series, Minky Woodcock, The Girl Who Electrified Tesla, published by Hard Case Crime Comics and edited by the amazing Charles R. Dye. Hello, Charles. And you can order that book, The Girl Who Electrified Tesla, from the links attached to this interview and to this panel. And that was the WonderCon at Home panel, which we ran last month with our mates at WonderCon. Hello, Justin. Hello, team. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody back at WonderCon next year. Thank you very much. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.